Amen. Okay, so we're looking at um, Queen Athalia. And if you've got your, your cards here, I don't know if you remember from, from this. If you haven't, don't worry. But last time we were looking about Israel, the side of Israel, and how Ahab's, King Ahab's house had got so bad um, that the Lord raised up Jehu. Now, what God was doing there was, was he was trying to get rid of false worship, the, the worship of Baal, um, which had come into to Israel and, and really was the dominant religion in the nation of Israel at that time. And the Lord raised up Jehu to, to, to cut it out. But in order to do it, he had to get rid of the house of Ahab because this false worship was so tied up with that house. So we looked last time um, how he'd killed the priests of Baal and he'd burned their idols, he'd destroyed the temple and turned it into a toilet. How he'd assassinated King Joram, how he'd killed Queen Jezebel, how he'd killed 70 of the royal sons and how he'd wiped out all the, those who were following um, Ahab's house in both Jezreel and Samaria. And then as we read last time in 2 Kings 10, 28, it says, thus Jehu wiped Baal from Israel. Now, that's wonderful in some ways, freeing up God's people from false worship. But the influence, this cancer that had so permeated Israel had got into Judah. And it got in through this, this lady, Athalia. And she, because of her influence, it was bringing a threat to God's very plan of salvation. So when you look about the, the rulers of, of the, the kings of Israel and Judah, it's not just an academic thing. It's not just a historical thing. Really, the application, the main application, obviously, is for, for people who are ruling nations. But most of us don't do that. But the, the, the picture is, is that you've got people who've been set up to rule over God's people. So the closest analogy that we've got really is about church leaders. So when you look at the, the kings, you're looking about, you know, what makes a good church leader? What makes a bad church leader? How can they rule over God's people in the right way? Wrong leaders bring devastation to churches. And I want to look this morning about what does it look like? What can we learn from this about being a good leader? in the house of God and whether you're a church leader or not there's principles in this that apply to all of us is you know whatever jurisdiction God's given us whether it's you know leading the household being faithful in a work environment we can learn some good things about characteristics of being good leaders so the first thing to notice is that this lady Athalia was a bad leader in chapter 24 if you were to read on in verse 7 She's described as that wicked woman. Who was she? Well, it says in 2 Kings 8 that um, Ahaziah was 22 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned for one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athalia, and she was a granddaughter of Omri, king of Israel. So she'd come through, through Omri's line, which is on the line of, of, of Israel. She hadn't come through Judah's line. She was on the line of Israel. And she had married um, a king of, of Judah. She'd married Jehoram. And this was bad news, really, because Athalia was the daughter of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. They were the ones really who'd, who'd caused all the problems in Israel. They were the ones who had been the, the root cause of all the bloodshed that Jehu had had to bring about in Israel. And yet we see this woman who's, who's married, now married into the line of Judah. This woman, daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. This woman who's clearly painted as a, as a bad and wicked woman. Her very name means afflicted of the Lord. This woman had come in and through marriage, she was now influencing the house of Judah. We're not told why they, this marriage happened. If you're thinking about, if you're thinking about there was one nation at one time and it split off. Do you remember through Rehoboam and Jeroboam into to Israel in the north and Judah in the south? 
Maybe this marriage was a way of trying to bring the two back together. It seemed like a good idea. If we could just form this, this royal marriage, this alliance between Israel and Judah, we could reform the nation into one. It's a warning really against good ideas in the church of God. Quite often we can say, you know, we can look at the ends and think this is, this is a reasonable thing to do. It's a good idea. I'm sure it's going to bring good. Doesn't God love unity? Let's bring these two things together. But the problem is, is that the fruit of good ideas that are not God's ideas always brings bad. And the fruit of this good idea, this marriage alliance, meant that Judah was being led to apostasy and it led to the near ruin of the house of David, which actually threatened the very plan of God's salvation in itself. God's plans can only be fulfilled in God's ways. It's not for church leaders to come up with good ideas. It's for church leaders to come under the word of God and to see what the Lord says and to seek him and allow him to speak and to do the things that he tells us to do. We need to be anchored in God's word. And so because of this, this marriage, the influence of Ahab and the false worship of Baal come into, into Judah. When you look at the genealogy here, Jehoshaphat was the last good king. His son Jehoram was the one who married Athaliah. And after he died, we, we see clearly that Athaliah had the ear of her son Ahaziah. If you look in verse 3 of chapter 22 of, of Second Chronicles, it said about Ahaziah, he also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother was his counsellor in doing wickedly. So you can see that even though her son was ruling, it was Athaliah who, who was pulling the strings. She had the, the control. She was leading. She was speaking. She was giving him counsel. Um, maybe Ahaziah should have been more like King Asa. Do you remember King Asa? Who had a similar situation with a mother-in-law who was into idolatry but he, he got rid of her because he recognized the bad influence. So Athaliah was a bad leader. But the first point I want to make really is that good leaders are chosen by God. You look at how Athaliah came into power in the first place. Um, verse 10, it says, Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal family of the house of Judah. So she saw her opportunity to come. Her son was in power and, and she liked that because she was the one who was really in power because she was telling him what to do. Now that her son's dead, she realizes that that power may be taken away from her. So what she does is she goes out and she murders all those people who would stand in her way. Maybe she was copying Jehu, maybe she was taking revenge because some of her, a lot of her relatives, all of her relatives really in, in, on that side had been killed through Jehu. But you've got to realise the horror of what she's just done. She's actually, for the sake of power, retaining power, she's just murdered her own grandchildren. Shocking. It's the sort of thing that you only really get stories of nowadays of things that come out from North Korea. That if someone stands up against, against the, the leader who's treated as a god, then they say something out of order and before you know it, they've gone. But yet it can be in the heart of all of us. How many people can, do we even kill, even the innocents? because of the things that we want to do with our lives, the things that we want to push forward in our lives, the things that we want to achieve in our lives, that even our very own children can become inconveniences and they're there to be removed. Such is the horror of what Athalia did that day. So she became the queen of Judah, but she was illegitimate. If you're to look at, again at, the genealogy that, that we've been looking at. See if you can spot the odd one out. King Solomon was the son of David. Rehoboam was the son of Solomon, the son of David. 
Abijah was the son of Rehoboam, the son of David. Asa was the son of Abijah, the son of David. Jehoshaphat was the son of Asa, the son of David. Jehoram was the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of David. Ahaziah was the son of Jehoram, the son of David. Athaliah was the daughter of Ahab, the son of Omri. You spot the other one out? She was illegitimate. For one thing, she was a foreigner. She was of, of foreign descent. And when you look in Deuteronomy 17 about the rules for kings of, to rule over God's people, Israel and Judah, he said, let no foreigner rule over you. But for another thing, she most definitely was not a descendant of David. She needed to be. God had promised David in 2 Samuel that there would be descendant on his throne would be there forever. It had to come through the line of David. And Athaliah clearly was not of the line of David. When Joash becomes king, he's a true descendant of King David. And they make out a big point to bring it out. The number of times David's picked out. So in, in verse 9 of, of 23, um, it talks about they brought out the large and small shields that had been King, King David. In verse 18, it says, And Jehoiada posted watchmen for the house of the Lord under the direction of the liturgical priests and the Levites, whom David had organized to be in the charge of the house of the Lord. And then it goes on to say, according to the order of David. They're clearly pointing out that this Joash is a rightful heir, whereas Athaliah was, was illegitimate. Joash was a son of David, no one else could do. And so when they crown him, in verse 3 of chapter 23, they say, Behold the king's son, let him reign as the Lord spoke concerning the sons of David. So Athaliah was not only illegitimate in the fact she was a foreigner, and therefore was clearly not a descendant of King David, had nothing to do with King David. But she, also she was not even a son. In the earlier chapters, when, they, when, they were, when Israel had asked for a king, it was all about he. When they were talking about the rules for setting up the king, it was all about he. He had to be of the line of David, and he had to be a he. It's all pointing to Jesus Christ, who was to come through that line. Jesus Christ is the son of God. He's not the daughter of God. So she was not even a son. And in our situation, in terms of good leaders being chosen by God, the Bible makes it clear that the leaders that the Lord wants in, in his house, in his church, are to be male. I know even saying this, this gets people's backs up. People don't like it. And particularly in this country, in the UK, people really don't like it. But the truth is, is that if we're going to come under God's word, if we're not going to come up with, with just our own good ideas of how ch we think church should be run, we think who should be a good, good person. Sorry, had an intermission there then we need to come under God's word. And if you'd read the, the, the piece of scripture that we'd ask people to read in 1 Timothy chapter 2, Paul says quite clearly, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. So if we're going to see the, the church in our nation built up and healthy and good and bringing glory to God and growing and being a blessing, then we need to come under God's word and we need to have good leaders that are chosen by God. Athaliah had usurped the throne through murderous means. And so she had to kill all the le legitimate claims to the throne. And when you look at what was really happening, was it was like the enemy of God was trying to destroy the house of David. It was trying to destroy this promise 
that had been given to King David, the promise of the Messiah, the promise of the King of Israel who was to come. But God had other ideas. And so the Lord raises up this lad, Joash. He's the anointed one. He's the one who's chosen by God. You know, there's many people in churches who might call leaders into office just out of, sit, out of sheer desperation. That sense that there's no one else. In the situation there for, for six years, most people in the land would have thought that there's no one else. There's no one else to come into office. This is, this is desperate. So maybe we're better with, with having someone like Athalia leading in the, in the first place because there's no one else. But the Lord will always raise up the people that he wants to raise up to fulfill his purposes. The Lord only needed one Moses. When all that, those Hebrew males were killed, Moses was preserved in the basket. He only needed one Moses. He only needed one, jo one Jesus. When Herod was trying to kill all, all the, the newborns, Jesus escaped. But there only needed to be one Jesus to fulfill what God had in mind. And there only needed to be one Joash. King Joash, his name means given by the Lord. He was hidden by his auntie, Jehoshabeth, and she and her husband, Jehoiada, brought him up in the house of the Lord. Jehoiada being the priest, he was brought up in the house of the Lord, chosen by God, set apart by God, formed in God's house, taught by God's godly mother and father. And then in verse 11 of chapter 23, they brought out the king's son and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony and they proclaimed him king and Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and they said, long live the king. So he was crowned. Crowned as king, the rightful heir, a son of David, legitimate. But he was also anointed. It's interesting that most of the kings, we, we don't get a, a, um, a description of them being anointed. But clearly, Joash is anointed here. Maybe because that godly line of David had been broken through Athalia. And it was just a point of restoring it, saying this is this is the line that fulfills the promise. So he was anointed. And we need to be legitimate. We need to be in the right place. We need to be chosen by God to be anointed. Many can wear the crown of leadership, but you need to have the anointing of God to know the blessing of God in your ministry and to be used to actually build up his church. So good leaders are chosen by God. Good leaders are also brave enough to remove the wrong people. Jehoiada, who was, who was acting as, as um, regent in charge, really, um, he, was, he was holding the true king, Joash, while he was growing up. It says in verse 1 of chapter 23 that he took courage. He knew what the right thing to do was. He was risking his life, but Athalia had to go. If God's purposes and plans were to come forth, Athalia had to go. She couldn't have remained where she was. She had to go. And so he, he plucks up courage. And actually, interestingly, when you work out the dates of it based from chapter 24, how old he was when he died, he was probably over 100 years old at this point. What did this old man have to lose? What was so frightening about this woman that he had to pluck up courage to go against her. She must have been a fearful woman. Well, she was a mother's daughter, her mother Jezebel, 
had put fear into, into even mighty Elijah's heart that made him run away for his own life. But it takes courage to stand up and to remove the wrong people from office. It takes a lot of courage. But her time had come, as we read in 2314. Bring her out between the ranks and anyone who follows her is to be put to death with the sword. For the priest said, do not put her to death in the house of the Lord. So they laid hands on her and she went into the entrance of the horse gate of the king's house and they put her to death there. Her time had come. And on the back of that, they go in in verse 17 and they kill the, the priest of, in the temple of Baal and they just destroy the temple. And then in verse 21, so all the people of the land rejoiced and the city was quiet after Athaliah had been put to death with the sword. So what Jehu had almost completed is now complete. The root of that worship of, of Baal in the land, in both Israel and Judah, had now been ripped out. So I guess the question is, did they live happily ever after? Well, yes, they did for a time. It brings me on to my next point, that good leaders are committed to restoring Christ's church. So good leaders not only get rid of the bad, but they also invest themselves in building the good. In chapter 24, verse 7, it says, For the sons of Athalia, that wicked woman, had broken into the house of God and had also used all the dedicated things of the house of the Lord for the Baals. So they, there was a lot to restore. The Baal worship had caused a big damage in the church of God at that time, if you want to put it that way, in, in Judah, in the worship of God. They destroyed the temple, they'd, they'd ruined it. And they'd, they'd taken out the utensil and used it in false worship. But built on the law of God, Jehoiada, the, the priest, and when old enough, Joash, sought to restore the worship of Yahweh from all the damage of Baal worship. Joash sought funds from the people and the, and the temple was repaired. The utensils were put in place and the regular burnt offerings. And we see the peak of his reign in chapter 24, verse 14, where it's all built, building up and it says they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord. A picture there of true worship had been restored in God's temple. False worship had been removed, that's one thing. But true worship had been implemented according to what God had written in his word. But sadly, Joash went into a downward slide from that point. And we need to remember that good leaders do the right thing in the right way. Good leadership is not just about removing the bad. It's not just about doing good and building up the church of God. You know, that's, that's partly where Jehu would never be used. Even though Jehu was the only good king, the only one that was spoken of in, in a good terms throughout the, the whole of the kings of Israel. He was, he was zealous in removing the false. But he could never be used to, to truly rebuild what was right in God. Because firstly, he was of the wrong descent. But he was also had been too influenced by the, the worship of Jeroboam. So he could remove the bad, but he could never be used to rebuild the good. Whereas Joash had the opportunity. And Jehoiada shows us that in building the good... We not only need to do the right thing, but we need to do the right thing in the right way. Joash went about things. He went about the removal of Athaliah in the right way. He, he went constitutionally, unlike Saul. Remember King Saul who took on the office? He was king, but he took on the office of priest, which was clearly wrong. Jehoiada, acting as regent, held it together in the right way. He did things in the right way, the right thing in the right way. And the fruit that he brought into the land was the fruit of unity. 
And that fruit of unity, that being united, God's people being united is key to seeing the blessing of God and to see the kingdom of God coming. We need to be united. He did things in the right way. He was able to unite the military and the priesthood. So what we read there in chapter 23, verses 1 to 10, he did it all in the right way. He gathered the army and the commanders and the Levites and the heads of the father's houses of Israel. And he got them all to, to agree a covenant in the house of the Lord that they would together make Joash king. So he got the leaders together. He got them involved. He didn't just go off by himself. But those other people who had positions of responsibility, he respected those positions and he included them in the decision making and he included them and got them on board so that they, the leadership were united at the top. And that's key for any church is that, that those who are in positions come together and, and respect each other and work together in those things. And through this, the people were united. Interestingly, Athalia only realized the plan to make Joash king when she walked into the temple and she'd heard the noise and she walked in and seen him there as king. He stood there between the pillars with the crown on his head. That was the only time. So people hadn't been <clears throat> spreading rumors. They hadn't been leaking it out, which is a, a huge sign of the unity of God's people in this. And then in verse 17 of chapter 23, we read, Then all the people went to the house of Baal and tore it down. His altars and images, they broke in pieces. All the people together had done this. They were moving together in the right way. And there's something powerful here about even, even a church that's under an ungodly oppressive system. If they remain united, there's a strength there. If they can remain united, there's a strength. We think about some of these churches who've suffered under like communist regimes. They may be small, they may be weak, but there's a power there. If this can stay united, even when the oppression is upon them, then when the time is right, they can come forth and break out and flourish and blossom. I guess in some ways it's a bit like getting your roots right. So you're pushing your roots down in the winter season, just, you know, getting your roots ready so that when springtime comes, you're ready to burst forth into life. This was a little bit of the picture here. Um, and what was going on in Judah at this time. And a lot of it had come through Jehoiada and his, his good leadership, not only doing the right thing, but doing it in the right way, making sure everyone was united, respecting each other and recognizing that they needed each other to move forward in the purposes of God. Interestingly, although Jehoiada wasn't actually a, a king, he acted as a king and he was recognized as a king. If you look in chapter 24, verse 16, it says of him, they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel and towards God and his house. But sadly, trouble comes when this godly man dies, which brings me to my last point, is that good leaders need to have good hearts. You look in chapter 24, verse 18, it says there that Joash abandoned the house of the Lord. He abandoned the house of the Lord. What an indictment that is. If it wasn't for the house of the Lord, he'd be dead. He was rescued and he was, he was brought into shelter in the house of the Lord. He was brought up, he was fed from the house of the Lord. He was loved in the house of the Lord. He owes his very life to the house of the Lord. But then when Jehoiada dies, he abandons the house of the Lord. His life becomes just this downhill descent. And we see why. Verse 17. After the death of Jehoiada, the princes of Judah came and paid homage to the king. Then the king listened to them. Beware of the flatterer. Beware of the flatterer. People coming and paying homage to you, lifting up your ego, making you proud. Beware of the flatterer. It says in Daniel 11, he shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. But the people who know their God 
shall stand firm and take action. This was a test as to what truly was in Joash's heart. It was, he did fine while he had Jehoiada over him as a father. But really he was just living, Jehoiada was living his life through Joash. When Jehoiada is removed, the true heart of Joash comes forth and sadly his heart was found wanting. It goes on to say in verse 18 and 24 that he started to serve the Asherim and the idols. So they got rid of Baal, one false god, and now they're bringing other ones in. Verse 19, they sent the prophets to him. Yet he sent prophets among them to bring them back to the Lord. These testified against them, but they would not pay attention. And then it comes to the, the lowest point in King Joash's life. We read in verse 20 of 2 Chronicles 24. Then the Spirit of God clothed Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, and he stood above the people and said to them, Thus says the Lord, why do you break the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has forsaken you. But they conspired against him, and by command of the king, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. Now then, did you get what's happened there? Not only did he close his ears to the prophets, but this one Zechariah, they actually kill him. They stone him there in the court of the house of the Lord, in front of the very temple of God itself. But did you notice who this Zechariah was? Verse 20, the son of Jehoiada, the priest. Joash would have grown up with this, this man. Although he wasn't a biological brother, he was a brother. He'd been adopted into that family. His godly father, Jehoiada, who'd adopted him, had brought him in, who'd, who'd shared the things of God with him, who'd helped, well, get him into the throne in the first place, who'd established him, who'd give him wise counsel. This is how he treated him, by killing his own son. This is how Joash treated his own brother, the one he'd probably played with, the one he'd probably shared meals with, the one who'd probably comforted him when he was ill. And this is how he repays him, by killing him. All because Joash did not want to hear what God wanted to say to him. Such was the heart of Joash. Good leaders need to have good hearts. This crime was even remembered by Jesus himself in Matthew 23, when he was talking to the Pharisees, those woes to the Pharisees, and he's talking about how throughout history, people like them had shed the blood of the righteous. And so sadly, Joash's reign comes to an end. You see then 24, 25, he's killed in his own bed by one of his servants. And then he says that he, he wasn't buried in the tombs of the kings, unlike Jehoiada. So Joash had a short-lived success, but an ultimate failure. And he only did well when his spiritual father, Jehoiada, was alive. Good leaders need to have good hearts. They need to have that integrity. It doesn't matter who's around them, but they, they're going to be good in season and out of season. Whether it's, it's favourable or whether it's unfavourable, they're going to do the right thing because their hearts have been changed by the Spirit of God. They truly believe the gospel of God. And they, they fear God and want to honour God in any and every situation. These are the types of leaders that we need in our land to see the, the church of God growing and being established. When you look about the kings, when you look at the Old Testament, it's clear that something more is needed. It's clear that there's no leader, whoever it be in the Old Testament, 
who can do the job that needs to be done. There are three main offices in the Old Testament, that, that of, of king, but also of prophet and of priest. No one was able to, to fulfill all three of these offices. At the time that this was, was going on, you, you've got Elijah and Elisha had, had been around or were, were currently around in, in Israel. The prophets of God, they were the only hope for Israel. They were the only ones who slightly kept Israel on track. It was because of God's prophecy through Elijah that, A, that Jehu had been raised up to destroy Ahab. There was a brief glimmer in, in this, what we've looked at this morning in Judah of it working. That they were fearing the law and the prophets that were coming under God's word. When Joash was anointed as king, they gave him the testimony. Now, now that's either the, the, the testimony of the, um, the, the first books of Moses, the five books of Moses, or it could have been just a little snippet out of Deuteronomy about what it meant to be a king. But they were building things on the word of God. And while Jehoiada was there, he was a faithful priest. And he was also acting as a king even though he wasn't a legitimate king, he wasn't in the line of David. Joash comes to the throne and he is a legitimate king. He is a descendant of David. Yet when Jehoiada dies, he ignores God's word and he kills the prophets. So the whole of the Old Testament is looking forward to, to where is this one who can truly be Israel's saviour where is this one who can truly stand there as prophet more than Elijah and Elisha who can truly stand there as king even more than King David but yet a descendant of King David who can stand there as priest faithful wise like Jehoiada but the one who can truly offer the right sacrifices before God so that God and man can be reconciled together. Looking forward to not only a man who's like that, but a man who will never die. Because the problem with the, with the kings of Israel and Judah is that even though it starts to be good, when one person dies, it can easily slip off into something bad. What the Old Testament's looking forward to, what it's pointing to, what the word of God is, is putting in the hearts of us all, is to say, where is this one who's king, who's prophet, who's priest, but who is also eternal. All this points to the truth that our salvation is only by Christ alone. It's only by Jesus Christ. It's only by Jesus, the King, the Priest, the Prophet, the Eternal One. Jesus, the only King worth serving, Jesus, the only prophet worth believing. Jesus, the only priest who can bring us to God. As we seek to serve the Lord, let us know our place under Christ. Let us pray for godly leaders in this land who know their place under Christ. They're not trying to spill out. They're not trying to be everything. They're recognising that Jesus is everything. But he may have called them into a particular office. Let them serve in the right way. Let them remove the wrong. Let them build up the right. Let them do it in the right way. Let them have good hearts. And when we all do this, we will see a church that truly glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together.